Thank you for putting up with our delay due to technical issues. We had a lot of very dedicated staff who were scurrying around uh, to pull the audio system together, and we genuinely appreciate uh, their work to, uh, to bring this all together. Today, we meet in open session as required by the government and the Sunshine Act to consider the safety research report entitled Bicyclist Safety on U.S. Roadways, Crash Risk and Countermeasures. This is the third recent research product covering vulnerable road users that the NTSB has done. The other two were about the safety of pedestrians and motorcyclists. Vulnerable road users are those who share the road with motor vehicle drivers, but do not have the occupant protection that is required in such vehicles. They are the road users who are most likely to lose life or limb on our roadways and highways. And most of the transportation accidents of all the modes, highway transportation is the mode in which the lion's share of the deaths and injuries occur. Last month, when the highway fatality numbers were released by the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, or NHTSA, we learned that 857 bicyclists, bicyclists died in crashes with motor vehicles in 2018. That's a 6.3% increase over 2017. And this was a year when total road, road fatalities were down by about 2.5%. So something is askew here. Today's report focuses on how we can prevent collisions between motor vehicles and bicycles by creating an infrastructure that separates bicycles from other traffic because preventing a crash from happening in the first place is our top priority. When bicyclists and motor, motorists can't be separated, it's important to maximize their awareness of each other to prevent collisions. That's where improved bicyclist conspicuity and improving vehicle technology comes in. And in the event that a bicycle crash cannot be prevented, we know that the best possible pr protection for a bicyclist is always wearing a bike helmet. Our researchers have made a very clear case using data from a variety of sources for each of the report's findings. But let me be clear what we're saying in plain English. If we do not improve roadway infrastructure for bicyclists, bicyclists will die who otherwise would not. If we do not enhance bicyclist conspicuity, likewise, additional bicyclists will die. If we do not act to mitigate head injury for more bicyclists, additional bicyclists will die. In the report that we discussed today, we have identified ways that bicycle safety can improve, and we've identified the organizations that can make the improvements happen. The question is, is whether these organizations will act. Staff have completed a thorough analysis of pertinent information to compile this draft report. And each of the board members have carefully studied the, the draft report. Today, staff will present their findings and their proposed recommendations to the board, and then we on the board will question the staff to make sure that the report that we adopt today truly provides the best opportunity to enhance safety. The public docket, for this report contains supplemental data and analyses and is available on our website at ntsb.gov. Once finalized, the safety research report will also be available on the NTSB's website. Now, Deputy Managing Director Paul Sledzik, if you'd kindly introduce the staff. Good morning. Good morning, sir. Thank you. A few announcements before we begin. I kindly request that you have not done so already. Please silence your mobile phones and other electronic devices. There are two exits from the boardroom here at the front of the auditorium on either side of the, of the dais. Go down the stairs through the door. This will take you out into hallways in the lower level of the office building and you'll depart the facility from there. 
The other exit is the way that you entered the boardroom. Walk up the aisles, proceed out the glass doors, uh, and exit through the large glass doors to the outside. Once you've exited, turn left and follow the sidewalk to the end of the street. NTSB staff and security personnel will direct you in the event of an emergency, and they'll also direct you when it's safe to return to the boardroom. There is also an AED device located in the lobby of the boardroom, and security personnel can call 911 if needed. If you have any questions, please do not hesitate to contact anyone on the NTSB staff. Seated at the panel this morning, unless otherwise noted, are staff members from the Office of Research and Engineering. To my right is Mr. James Ritter, Director of the Office of Research and Engineering. To Mr. Ritter's right is Dr. Eric Emery, Chief of the Safety Research Division in the Office of Research and Engineering. Next to Dr. Emery is Dr. Ivan Chung, Research Manager in the Safety Research Division. And to Dr. Chung's right is Dr. Jana Price, who is a re researcher in the Safety Research Division. Behind Dr. Price is Ms. Julie Perot, a safety recommendation specialist focused on highway issues from the Office of Safety Recommendations and Communications. To Ms. Perot's left is Dr. Julie Kang, a technical advisor from the Office of Highway Safety. To Dr. Kang's left is Dr. Robert Malloy, director of the Office of Highway Safety. To Dr. Malloy's left is Ms. Kathleen Silbaugh, the NTSB general counsel. And to Ms. Silbaugh's left is Mr. Jeff Marcus, chief of the safety recommendations division in the Office of Safety Recommendations and Communications. Behind Mr. Marcus is Mr. Michael Portman, uh, who will be handing visuals and timers today all, all from the Office of Research and Engineering. And to his right is Dr. Kathleen Curry, who's the writer and editor on this report from the Office of Research and Engineering. The presentations will begin this morning with an introduction by uh, Dr. Eric Emery. Good morning, Chairman Sumwalt and members of the board. We're pleased to present this safety research report about bicyclist safety for your consideration. Safety research refers to the process used to carry out part of the NTSB's mandate to conduct studies about risk in the transportation environment and the effectiveness of transportation safety countermeasures at reducing accidents and injuries. We believe the report here has identified important safety recommendations that will help prevent bicycle crashes involving motor vehicles and mitigate bicyclist injury. Because of the health and environmental benefits associated with bicycling, the use of bicycles as a means of transportation has grown in recent years. However, bicyclists, like pedestrians and motorcyclists, are considered vulnerable road users because they are unprotected by an enclosed vehicle compartment, leaving them more vulnerable to injury or death in the event of a crash with a motor vehicle. According to the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, or NHTSA, 806 bicyclists died in crashes with motor vehicles in 2017, the most recent full year of data available. Although they comprised a small percentage of traffic fatalities overall, bicyclist fatalities are comparable to deaths resulting from railroad or marine accidents, and they represented more than twice the number of deaths resulting from aviation accidents in that same year. Although the NTSB has begun to address safety issues relevant to vulnerable road users, it has been 47 years since we have examined bicyclists. Consequently, there is a need to update our understanding of bicycle safety in the United States. This slide shows bicyclist fatality rates per 100,000 people from 1980 to 2016. In 2008, indicated on the graph by the vertical blue arrow, the bicyclist fatality rate was 0.24 deaths per 100,000 people. That same year, the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services Office of Disease Prevention and Health Promotion set the Healthy People 2020 goal for, bicyclist, for the bicyclist fatality rate at 0.22 deaths per 100,000 people, shown on the graph with a yellow horizontal line. Since 2010, the bicyclist fatality rate has been mostly increasing with a slight decline in 2014. However, in 2016, it reached a rate of 0.26 deaths per 100,000 people, the highest it's been for roughly the past decade. 
The goals of this research were to describe fatal and non-fatal injury trends associated with bicycle crashes involving motor vehicles, to examine the scope and nature of bicyclist crash and injury risk factors, to identify proven countermeasures that may be underused, and to assess obstacles that may be interfering with the full use of these countermeasures. The research also explored new emerging issues that may have a direct or indirect influence on bicyclist safety, such as the growing use of e-scooters and other shared use micromobility devices, and the need for a more comprehensive approach to bicycling safety in the United States. To identify safety issues associated with bicycle crashes involving motor vehicles, the NTSB conducted a detailed review of the scientific literature and available safety countermeasures. Staff analyzed activity, crash, and injury data from multiple sources to understand the prevalence of these crashes and their associated risk factors. Staff also conducted interviews with national, regional, state, and local stakeholders listed here on this slide. Information gathered from these interviews were combined with the results from the data analyses and literature review to identify safety issue areas, assess the most applicable countermeasures, and develop recommendations to improve bicycle safety. The report being discussed here today addresses three main bicycle safety issue areas, improving roadway infrastructure for bicyclists, enhancing bicycle and bicyclist conspicuity, and mitigating bicyclist head injury. The principal investigator for this report was Dr. Ivan Chung, and he was assisted by Dr. Jana Price. In addition, they received support from a number of staff from the Office of Research and Engineering, the Office of Highway Safety, and the Office of Safety Recommendations and Communications. Thank you, this concludes my presentation. Next, Dr. Chung will discuss the draft report's findings on improving roadway infrastructure for bicyclists. Thank you, Dr. Emery. In this presentation, I will focus on roadway infrastructure safety countermeasures that are effective but underutilized. Crashes between bicycle and motor vehicles can occur in many locations. This diagram shows an example in an urban setting. All crash locations are categorized into three groups. The areas shown in the blue are mid-block locations, generally including road segments between intersections. The second group shown in yellow includes all intersection locations. They can be signalized or unsignalized. The remaining group shown in red includes all others such as driveway access. This diagram shows the 10 most frequent crash scenarios in which a bicyclist was fatally injured between 2014 and 2016. As shown by the bars in dark blue, these crashes largely occur at mid-block locations. In fact, the most bicyclist deaths occur when a motorist overtook a bicyclist mid-block. These 614 deaths represented 25% of all bicyclist fatalities. In comparison, only 7% of all bicycle crashes involving motor vehicles were of this type. This suggests that preventing these types of mid-block crash could considerably reduce fatalities and serious injuries among bicyclists. To examine how likely it is a bicyclist involved in a crash with a motor vehicle may sustain a fatal and serious injury, staff conducted an analysis of 5,266 individual bicyclists involved in crashes with motor vehicles in 2017 in four states. While controlling the land use and posted speed limit, staff found that when a bicyclist gets into a crash in mid-block locations, he or she is twice as likely to sustain fatal or serious injury compared to other locations, such as intersections. Further, staff found that a bicyclist involved in a crash with motor vehicle in an area with a posted speed limit of 30 to 35 mph is 65% more likely 
to sustain a fatal and serious injury compared to area with a posted speed limit of 25 miles per hour or less. As demonstrated in the last two slides, mid-block crashes, especially on higher speed roadways, such as urban arterials with multiple lanes with high traffic volume, are more likely to be severe. One way to improve bicycle safety is by installing a separated bike lane to increase separation between bicycle and vehicular traffic. As shown in this diagram, the separated bike lane is placed on the right side of the roadway. In this example, on-street parking is used as a barrier to separate the traffic. Because of the separation, a separated bike lane is expected to eliminate mid-block crashes between motor vehicles and bicyclists, which tend to produce the most severe injury. In our stakeholder interviews, many transportation officials in state and local agencies expressed the desire to plan and implement separated bike lanes. Although 35 state DOT officially recommend the implementation of separated bike lanes, only four state DOTs had them installed along the state railways. Therefore, this effective countermeasure is currently under use. Separated bike lanes come in many forms. The most common design is the one-way separated bike lane that is installed on the right side of a roadway as shown in these two pictures. The one on the left uses vertical barriers to provide separation, while the one on the right uses both vertical barriers as well as on-street parking. These two pictures show examples of two-way separated bike lanes. The one on the left is protected by on-street parking as well as vertical barriers. The one on the right provides complete separation from vehicular and pedestrian traffic, as shown here by the highlighted areas. Depending on the design, different separated bike lanes may present different safety challenges. For example, the example shown on the left is located in a very busy street with frequent intersections and garage access. These factors, combined with the two-way bicycle traffic, present special challenges in terms of safety. Therefore, geometric design and selection guidance are needed to maximize the safety benefits of separated bike lanes and minimize unintended adverse effects. Even with better protection at mid-block locations, a bicyclist inevitably has to navigate through an intersection. This diagram now highlights bicycle fatalities that occur at intersection locations, shown in orange here. The three crashes that occur for the most bicyclist death involve bicyclists and motorists crossing paths or bicyclists fails to use a signalized or non-signalized intersection. They accounted for 466 deaths that, presented, that represented 19% of all bicyclist fatalities. In comparison, 24% of all bicycle crashes involving motor vehicles were of these types. Although these intersection crashes are not as lethal as mid-block crashes, they occur frequently and safety treatments at these locations are needed. Since 2009, the Federal Highway Administration has approved three safety treatments at intersection for bicyclists. One of the most effective treatments is the installation of a bicycle signal phase. It is a designated signal phase an indicator for bicyclists to proceed through an intersection. Research showed that these devices reduce the overall bike crash rates by up to 45%. As shown in the last slide, 170 bicyclists died between 2014 and 2016 as a result of failing to use as synchronized intersections. Research showed that the installation of bicycle signal phase increased the bicyclist compliance with the traffic control device at intersection. Making a left turn poses risk to a bicyclist, especially if he or she is traveling in a separated bike lane positions on the right sides of a roadway. These two pictures show the same location. A bicyclist is riding in a separated bike lane on the right sides of the road and intending to make a left turn as shown by the, air, by the yellow arrows. 
The picture on the left shows the installations of a two-stage bicycle turn box. This visually delineated area indicates to the bicyclist where a left turn can be safely made in two stages. As shown on the right, this is installed next to the pedestrian crosswalk and is protected from the vehicular traffic because of its alignment with an on-street parking zone. The bicyclist turns at the box, faces the direction where he or she intends to go, and waits for the pedestrian traffic signal. Research showed that this treatment significantly improved consistency in how bicyclists navigated two-stage turns at intersection and show no adverse impacts on safety. Therefore, effective infrastructure, safety treatments, safety improvement for bicyclists exists. However, the adoption and implementation can be limited by the lack of consolidated geometric design guidance and standards. An effective way to increase adoptions of infrastructure safety measures is to include them in official guidance and standard documents, such as the Guide for the Development of Bicycle Fatal Facilities, which was last put, published by the American Associations of State Highway and Transportation Officials, or ASTO, in 2012. The current edition does not contain information about separated bike lanes and safety treatments at intersection, such as bicycle signal phase and two-stage bicycle turn box. Because separated bike lanes and safety treatment at intersection can create a safer network of roadways for bicyclists, and because consolidated geometric design guide for these infrastructure improvements are needed by the transportation planner and engineers, staff is proposing a recommendation to ASTO to ensure that separated bike lanes and intersection treatments are included in the next revisions of the guide for the development of bicycle facilities. Speed and speeding are important issues facing vulnerable road users, such as bicyclists. The diagram on the left shows a typical roadway with two lanes of vehicular traffic in both directions, and there is no designated area for bicycle traffic. If excessive speed in this roadway presents a safety issue to all road users, a proven roadway safety countermeasure, known as the road diet, can be implemented. <coughs> A road diet typically involves repositioning pavement markings in order to, pro to reduce the number of through links and replace them with a center turn link. In some cases, as shown in this example, a road diet opens up space to install bicycle links. Research showed that road diets improve safety by reducing total crashes by 19 to 47%. Many agencies across the United States have successfully implemented them as the FHWA has encouraged the use and provided technical assistance to state and local agencies since 2008 through the Proven Safety Countermeasure Initiative. There are two FHWA programs that can accelerate state and local adoptions of proven but underused safety countermeasures. They are the Proven Safety Countermeasure Initiative, which was first established in 2008 and subsequently updated in 2012 and 2017. As discussed in the previous slide, road diet has been included in this initiative since 2008, and many state and local agencies have successfully implemented them. The second program is Everyday Counts, which includes many innovative programs, including safety countermeasures. Through both programs, the FHWA provides free technical assistance and resources to state and local agencies to encourage the adoptions of proven countermeasures. Yet, to date, no bicycle safety, no bicycle is safety specific countermeasure, such as separated bike links and infrastructure and intersection safety treatments has been included in these programs. This is inconsistent with the USDOT 2010 policy calling for the improvements of bicycle and pedestrian safety and the full integrations of bicycling and walking into the US transportation system. Therefore, staff is proposing recommendations to the FHWA to include separated bike links and intersection safety treatment in the Proven Safety Countermeasure Initiative 
and the Everyday Counts program. This concludes my presentation, and Dr. Price will address issues of conspicuity. Thank you, Dr. Chung. Good morning. We know from our own research and that of others that bicyclist fatalities occur disproportionately in dark conditions, and that in some cases, drivers may fail to detect a bicyclist in their path, even though they are scanning the environment. In this presentation, I will discuss several countermeasures that have the potential to improve bicyclist detection. Some of these countermeasures, such as conspicuity treatments for bicycles, improving headlights, and addressing large vehicle blind spots are designed to improve drivers' ability to see bicyclists. Other countermeasures, like collision avoidance systems and connected vehicle technologies, are designed to allow vehicles to detect bicyclists so that actions may be taken to avoid a collision. Research has shown that conspicuity treatments, such as reflective clothing and the use of lights and reflective materials on bicycles, improve visibility and reduce crashes. However, there is less evidence to show whether efforts to increase their use have been successful. Neither education nor laws have been shown to increase bicyclists' use of high visibility clothes or bicycle lights. Because of the challenges inherent in increasing bicyclists' use of such treatments, retroreflective materials and lights included on the bicycle at the time of manufacture may be the most reliable bicycle conspicuity enhancement for most riders. The requirements for bicycle reflectors on newly manufactured bicycles are set by the U.S. Consumer Product Safety Commission, or CPSC, and were last updated in 1980. The regulations include requirements for the color and placement of reflectors, as well as for their reflective performance and resistance to damage from impacts and heat. The image on this slide shows the general placement requirements set by the CPSC. In the nearly 40 years since the regulations were established, improvements have been made in reflective materials. Additionally, light emitting diode or LED lights have largely replaced bulb based lights and some manufacturers are incorporating lights into their bicycle designs. Staff believes that there is value in reviewing and possibly updating the regulations to incorporate these more advanced capabilities. As a result, staff is proposing a recommendation to the CPSC to conduct an evaluation to determine if bicycle conspicuity could be improved by modifying the regulations. The next countermeasure I will discuss focuses on how improving motor vehicle headlights can improve drivers' ability to detect bicyclists and other vulnerable road users. In our 2018 Special Investigative Report on Pedestrian Safety, the NTSB issued two safety recommendations to NHTSA to improve motor vehicle headlights. H1839 called upon them to include performance-based on-road standards for vehicle headlight systems. This recommendation was made because current headlight standards only require bench testing, and research done by highway safety organizations has shown that headlight performance varies greatly when tested in actual driving conditions. H1840 recommended that NHTSA revise its motor vehicle safety standards to allow for adaptive headlight systems. Current U.S. standards do not allow for headlights that can, as shown in this image, provide high beam illumination except within a segment of the beam that is adjusted to limit glare for oncoming drivers. Such advanced headlight systems are commonly used in other parts of the world. In October 2018, NHTSA published a notice of proposed rulemaking to amend regulations to allow for certification of adaptive headlight systems. However, a final rule has not yet been issued. With respect to developing standards for on-vehicle tests of headlight systems, the agency has not progressed. Staff believes that these headlight recommendations, if accomplished, would benefit bicyclist safety as well as pedestrian safety, and as a result, staff is proposing to reiterate them. Another way to improve driver's ability to detect bicyclists is by addressing blind spots. 
as shown in the red shaded areas of this image. Large vehicles, such as heavy trucks, tend to have larger blind spots than smaller vehicles, which can make it difficult for their drivers to detect and maneuver around bicyclists. This can be particularly problematic in urban areas where large vehicles operate near bicyclists and other vulnerable road users. In 2013 and 2014, the NTSB made three recommendations to develop performance standards for visibility enhancement systems to compensate for blind spots and to require those systems on large trucks. Although there has been continued research and development in this area, NHTSA has not developed performance standards for visibility enhancement systems for large vehicles nor required their use. Consequently, staff proposes to reiterate these recommendations. In addition to improving the likelihood that drivers can detect and avoid collisions, I would also like to discuss collision avoidance systems that can be incorporated into vehicles. For more than two decades, the NTSB has been advocating for the development and implementation of vehicle technologies that could reduce the likelihood of collisions, and the issue is on our current most wanted list. Several recommendations NTSB has made, if addressed, would likely improve bicyclist safety as well as improving overall traffic safety. The NTSB has made three recommendations to NHTSA to incorporate collision avoidance systems into its new car assessment program, or NCAP, which provides consumer information through a five-star rating program. In 2015, as part of a report on preventing rear-end collisions, NTSB issued recommendations H156 and 7, which called for NCAP to rate the performance of collision avoidance systems and to include the ratings on new vehicle stickers. In 2018, as part of our pedestrian safety report, NTSB issued H1843, which called on NHTSA to incorporate pedestrian safety systems, including pedestrian collision avoidance systems, into the NCAP. Although bicyclist detection is a relatively new technology, some automakers are developing such technologies. Additionally, some international NCAP programs, such as the European New Car Assessment Program, known as Euro NCAP, are incorporating vulnerable road user protection, including detection of pedestrians and bicyclists into their overall scoring system. Based on our review, we believe that collision avoidance technologies could be modified to detect bicycles, thereby reducing collisions and injuries. We also believe that NHTSA's delays in updating NCAP have likely slowed the development and implementation of important safety systems. Accordingly, staff is proposing a recommendation to NHTSA to incorporate into NCAP tests to evaluate a car's ability to avoid crashes with bicycles. Staff is also proposing to reiterate the open NCAP recommendations. Connected vehicle technologies, which allow vehicles to communicate with one another directly or through infrastructure, also have the potential to warn of conflicts and avoid crashes. In 2013, the NTSB recommended that NHTSA develop minimum performance standards for connected vehicle technology for all highway vehicles and require that the technology be installed on all newly manufactured vehicles. In 2017, NHTSA issued a proposed rulemaking concerning connected vehicle technology on light vehicles. NTSB responded that NHTSA should expand the mandate to all highway vehicles. In sum, NHTSA's slow progress in this area has delayed the implementation of potentially life-saving technology, and staff proposes reiterating these recommendations. In recent years, the DOT has also sponsored research investigating the potential of vehicle-to-pedestrian, or V2P, systems to improve safety for vulnerable road users. V2P refers to communications between vehicles, pedestrians, or bicyclists using personal electronic devices or technologies in the vehicles. They have the potential to alert both the driver and the bicyclist or pedestrian, which may increase the likelihood that an action will be taken to avoid a collision. The DOT has identified several groups that could benefit from V2P systems, including pedestrians, bicyclists, and other people using wheelchairs and other mobility devices. However, of the 14 projects it describes in a 2017 report, only one of them includes consideration of bicyclists, and even then, only when bicyclists were traversing crosswalks. 
Staff is proposing that the DOT should expand its B2P research efforts to ensure that bicyclists and other vulnerable road users will be incorporated into the safe deployment of connected vehicle systems. This completes my presentation. Next, Dr. Chung will discuss mitigating head injury. Thank you, Dr. Price. So far, we have been focusing on crash prevention. Now I will turn our attention to how bicyclists can protect themselves in an event of a crash. Research conducted by others using the National Electronic Injury Surveillance System, or NIS, from 1984 through 1988 showed that 62% of bicycle-related fatalities and 32% of bicycle-related emergency department visits were related to head injuries. Staff analyzed the same data set from 2014 through 2017 and found that an estimated 80,000 bicyclists sustained head injuries in crashes with motor vehicles. Although we focus on bicycle crashes involving motor vehicles in these safety research reports, it is important to note that the need to mitigate head injuries applies to all bicycle crashes even without the involvement of a motor vehicle. In fact, from 2014 through 2017, more than half a million bicyclists sustained head injuries. Research showed that in an event of a crash, the most effective way to reduce head injury is by wearing a bicycle helmet. For example, a recent meta-analysis showed that wearing a bicycle helmet reduces the likelihood of all head injuries by 48% and serious head injury by 60%. Despite the proven benefits of head injury mitigation, head helmet use among bicyclists of all ages is low. According to these 2012 NHTSA surveys of bicyclists and pedestrian attitude and behavior, 46% of respondents reported that they never wore a helmet. Our analysis of bicyclist fatality and injury data from 2010 through 2017 showed that among those with known helmet use status, 79% of fatally injured bicyclists and 63% of bicyclists involved in crashes with motor vehicles were not wearing helmets. And young bicyclists, especially those between the age of 15 and 24, were found to have the lowest helmet use levels. According to NHTSA, bicycle helmet laws for children and adults were identified as the most and second most effective behavioral safety countermeasures. Other research also found that youth helmet laws were effective in increasing helmet use by as much as 84%. All stakeholders who participate in our interviews promoted the use of bicycle helmets for all bicyclists. As demonstrated by the advocacy work through education, outreach, and helmet distribution efforts. Currently, there is no state with an all ages bicycle helmet requirement. However, some local jurisdictions have successfully passed all ages bicycle helmet requirements. For example, the state of Washington has 30 local jurisdictions with all ages bicycle helmet requirements. Staff analyzed the 1,306 crash-involved bicyclists in Washington state in 2017 and found that those involved in crashes in counties or city with an all ages helmet requirement were twice as likely to be wearing helmets. NHTSA currently emphasizes education and awareness campaigns with respect to bicycle safety, and such emphasis is inconsistent with its own identifications of helmet laws as the most effective countermeasure. Therefore, a comprehensive strategy that includes both legislative and non-legislative approaches is still needed, and NHTSA is best positioned to convene a coalition of stakeholders to develop such a strategy. Staff is proposing recommendation to NHTSA to work with a coalition of stakeholders to develop a comprehensive national strategy to increase bicycle helmet use for all ages. That includes both legislative and non-legislative intervention methods. 
Finally, the report find and stakeholder agree that a more comprehensive approach is needed to fully assess and improve bicycling safety on US roadways. Such an approach demands a commitment to bicycling safety from policymakers, transportation planners, engineers, educators, law enforcement, bicycle safety advocates, and most of all, bicyclists. Improvement to roadway infrastructure for bicyclists, conspicuity enhancement for bicycle and bicyclists, and an increased focus on helmet use to help mitigate bicyclist injuries are all needed. And finally, the collection of bicycling activity, crash, and injury data must be improved to better understand and address existing bicycle safety issue, such as comprehensive approach also call for the continuous monitoring of new and emerging issues. Thank you. That concludes the presentation for today. The team is prepared to answer any question. Well, thank you for laying out the case, and we'll begin now with board member questions. Vice Chairman Landsberg. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. You know, um, the Netherlands has probably the most enthusiastic bicycle population in the world. Um, talk to us a little bit about how they've managed to do it, uh, what's their helmet usage, and um, you know, how, how do they manage to do so well? Thank you for the questions. And unfortunately, I haven't been to Netherlands, so a lot of that is sort of like uh, my, my research and reading about it. Well, I think you should go. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, so the, the Netherlands have a fairly long history. I would say probably in the last 30 years or so has been committed to making bicycling as part of the uh, complete streets and a part of the overall transportation uh, strategy. And they have tens of thousands of protected bike way, or in this report, we call that separated bike lane. And they also have infrastructure, they also have intersection treatments such as protected intersection. And not to shame the United States, but uh, we are about to have our very first protected intersection in Silver Spring, Maryland. And we are probably 20, 30 years behind. And so with those improvements, you will see that uh, uh, the, the bicycle is as a transportation mode share is a very, very high. Like some city could be more than 40% of the daily, daily trips are done by bicycling. With all those things in, in place, the bicycle knows what they are supposed to do and the driver knows how to navigate around, around bicycle. So I think that explains a lot of how um, the, the safety in the Netherlands is consider considerably better in the United States for bicyclists. So there's sort of a, a multi-factored approach to this in that they, they started off with a, with a um, uh, roadway diet, if you will, uh, to make sure that bicyclists had their place to go and everybody sort of understood what the, what the rules of the road were. Uh, I was uh, privileged to be in Netherlands uh, earlier this fall and we saw very few people wearing helmets. And I don't think there's any argument that helmets really work. I just sort of wonder how uh, here in the United States, uh, how, that's, how that's going to play uh, in the grand scheme of things. Uh, I definitely think that, and, and I think uh, the team definitely think that bicycle helmets is extremely important. And I think we laid out a pretty good case that uh, the advocacy of helmet in protecting your heads is very high. The difference between the Netherlands and the United States is that I think in the stage of where we are in terms of our infrastructure and, in, and also in terms of our you know, bicycle and driver culture, you know, it's, a, it's significantly different. So I think un, until the time that the, the United States bicycle infrastructure get to a point that it is considerably safer to navigate around a city or a suburban area, I think we cannot forget the importance of uh, how much use you know, for all ages and all, all bicyclists. So I think, I, think, I, think, I think the difference is, is, is where we are in terms of our infrastructure. Mm -hmm. How many, um, I think you mentioned this in your, in your presentation, how many, uh, uh, well, I think you said no states have a requirement for helmets, but there are a number of municipalities and they've had a positive benefit from this? Um, 
Yes, uh, right now we don't have any all ages requirements for the 50 states in the District of Columbia. Uh, however, there are about 22, I believe, if uh, correct me if I'm wrong, we have about 22 states that have a youth helmet requirement at state wise. However, uh, at the local level, you know, like county level or city level, and there are numbers of uh, jurisdiction, I believe that the number could be in the 60s high 50 or, or low 60 community that have actually successfully gather, you know, coalitions of a supporter to put together legislation to uh, push for all helmets um, use. However, you know, the way that they, they typically do it is that they really do have to get a coalitions of supporter together and work out the, work out the um, concerns of unintended consequences and things like that before they they put the legislation in place. So it's really important then to make sure that uh, you have all the players at the table and that they understand how this is going to work and the benefits and, and, and some of the challenges that go along. Is, is that correct? Absolutely correct. And I think, I think as we, as we, as we uh, conclude our presentation, the most important thing is a comprehensive approach. And so that's why this report focus on not just helmets, but also the other parts, like infrastructure, conspicuity. But even in terms of the helmets, uh, uh, helmet use, uh, in trying to increase helmet use, it is very important to bring everybody together on the table so everybody you know, have to say and trying to figure that out what would be the best way to increase helmet use. Have we had any uh, discussion with some of the bicycle groups in terms of what their feelings are about uh, wearing helmets? I, I realize that might be a bit of a challenge, but uh, just to throw it out there. Um, clearly, we have spoken to uh, both bicycle safety advocacy group as well as bicycle advocacy. And in fact, I will welcome a couple of uh, bicycle ad advocates over here. And I think, uh, you know, in general, there are some concern about unintended consequences. Most of the concern is, is around the, 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 the idea that uh, uh, helmet requirements may reduce bicycling level. So I think that is, a, that's an in, that is an unintended consequences that really worth the discussion. And I think that's why we, our recommendation call for a national leadership from NHTSA to actually work on that issue and perhaps be able to come up with a strategy, you know, that unintended consequences, you know, become a non-factor. And I think that's why uh, we have a recommendation the way we put it. I understand, thank you. Vice Chairman, thank you very much. Member Hamadi. Thank you, and uh, I wanna thank all of you for a great report. I was really looking forward to reading it. I am a bicyclist, and so uh, I really appreciate all your efforts. I wanted to talk about uh, data collection and the challenges with data collection. And I wanna refer first to page 19. We have a chart, I think it's figure one. Uh, where we have distance bicycled per year per person in miles among 14 countries. And it shows that um, residents in the Netherlands bicycled the most, followed by those who live in Denmark and Germany, and US residents bicycled the least among the 14 countries. And to me, I, it, it, the numbers for the US looked a little low. And so I'm trying to understand how that data is collected on bicycle activity. Are we looking mostly at commuters? I'm, a, you know, I, I don't commute with my bicycle, but I do do road cycling and triathlons and everything else. But I, you know, I'm wondering how you would even count those. Uh, thank you for the questions and uh, I appreciate your comment because I myself is not a bike commuter either, but I think I have a lot of mileage yeah. in, in terms of bicycling. And uh, so um, this particular chart is, uh, we, we take it from a um, European reports. And uh, the data actually come from National Travel Survey, not unlike what we have in the United States. So this is based on survey questions. Some of them are telephones, some of them are online. And so this actually asks people, how far do you buy, how often do you buy, or in a given day, you know, whether you buy 
or how much you bike in that particular day. And that's um, and based on that sample and schools up to the to the national national level. So um, in the case for the United States, and this was actually done, the latest one was done in 2017, but the one before that was 2009. So there was a really, really long time in between the two survey. So we find that it's very difficult you know, for us to actually understand whether this, there was a significant change or not. And also on top of that, the survey changes you know, from one period to another. And this surveys also talks about, you know, uh, it, it, it did include uh, activity involving using a bike to go to work or go to school or recreations and things like that. Compared to the European uh, comparisons, the big difference is that, if, for example, in the Netherlands, the data is collected every year, unlike the United States. So they have a much better way of, you know, gauging, gauging the changes. And in Denmark, I believe that the, 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 the surveys are actually get a continuity, meaning any given day, someone could be asked that question. So that's also show the commitments of the, of the country in terms of understanding the bicycling level. So how could we then collect that information. I mean, what, we, what do, it seems like the European countries have a better way of collecting information than, than we do. How could we improve? I think the, the best way to improve it is basically use as many tools as possible. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, we, we need to combine both the national uh, travel survey as well as some of the other survey, let's say, conducted by the US Census that deal with commuting. And, but we also need to rely on newer technology. You know, some of them could be, you know, uh, 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 um, a permanent or temporary bike counting technology. It could be an inductive loop, or it could be a radar-based uh, technology, but also using crowdsourcing technology, such as some of us have a smartwatch and they will keep track of where we, where we have been, where have been biking. So that get to the idea of who is biking, how far we're biking, and the most important thing is when we are biking and where we are biking. And by combining all of those things that we will have a much better way of understanding our bicycling activity level. And we made a recommendation to FHWA to help people do that. Okay, and when I come back for the next round, I do wanna ask about how data is collected on uh, bicycle fatalities and um, and uh, the difference between um, bicycle fatalities and actually the rate. So, Member Hamadi, thank you very much. Dr. Emery, I think you said that this was the first uh, time in 47 years the NTSB has analyzed bicycle safety in the U.S. Uh, I believe that's pretty much what you said, but, but Dr. Malloy, uh, I'm going to direct this to you. Uh, we have investigated bicycle crashes. It's not like we've totally neglected uh, bicycle safety. This is just the first time in 47 years that we've done a comprehensive study. Is that correct? That is correct. We recently uh, investigated a crash involving a bicyclist in Cooper Township, Michigan. Uh, that involved a um, driver uh, hitting a group of bicyclists who were riding. Um, and we, we came to uh, the decision that the driver in that case was impaired. But again, uh, we have not done a comprehensive look across the country of bicycling since then. Thank you very much. Dr. Chung, um, as I understand it, this study looked at looked at bicycle collisions uh, and getting tangled up with motor vehicles, but we did not look at single bicycle crashes or bike-to-bike uh, -bike crashes. Is that, is that correct? Uh, yes, that's correct. In terms of, uh, you know, crash risks uh, and things like that, yes, we did not look at bike-to-bike -bike or even single bike uh, crashes uh, nor bike-to-pedestrian crash. Um, part of the reason is that data is just very difficult when it's, com when, when it's come to, you know, other type of crashes. 
However, we did talk, we, in our study, we did talk about the fact that bicycle fatality involving motor vehicle is a very, very small part, small parts of the injury burden. And there are uh, non-fatal injury involving bike and, and motor vehicle, but also injury involving bicyclists without getting, in, get, getting involved with a crash with motor vehicle. And that's come from injury surveillance, surveillance data. I think one thing that uh, is, is also important to, to keep in mind is that I would say most of our recommendations over here would actually benefit with uh, crashes without involving motor vehicle as well, such as infrastructure as well as conspicuity issue and, and definitely helmet use. So when we talk about, uh, I think, uh, what, 857 bicycle uh, fatalities last year, uh, it, it could actually be a higher number than that because we're only accounting for the, for the bicycle to, to motor vehicle collisions. Definitely, definitely. There would be other, there, were, there, there are fatality involving single, single bicycle crashes, like people, you know, riding super fast and, and you know, run off the road and hit a tree or hit a guardrail and tumble over and things like that. Um, there's also not being counted is if it does not involve a moving vehicle. You know, there are cases that you know very serious injury can be caused by uh, what we call dooring, dooring um, and, and accidents. And there are cases, you know, people not paying attention when they're riding can actually hit a parked car and get killed. So those are, those are the crashes that would not be incorporated into the 857 fatality that you quoted. Thank you, and I realize that after the report was initially drafted and presented to the board members, uh, NHTSA came out with final figures for 2017 and preliminary figures for 2018, which did require a good bit of rework for staff in those uh, few weeks. So I appreciate all the hard work that you've uh, put into not only creating the report, drafting the initial report, but going back and making sure that it consisted of the most uh, up-to-date data. It was interesting that uh, the most serious crashes uh, occurred at mid-block, uh, whereas the majority, I think the greater number of, of collisions actually occurred at intersections, which is, we would expect that but the more serious injuries were mid-block, and, and is your reasoning behind that because uh, of uh, greater speeds during the mid-block? Definitely at the intersection, um, definitely at the intersection area, there could be a higher exposure in terms of the interaction between the bicyclist and the motor vehicle. However, as, you, as we all know, as we are driving, you know, from a mid-block to an intersection, we tend to slow down either, you know, just naturally we slow down in intersections or when we are making, you know, turns. So there is a speed uh, associated with the, uh, with, with, the, um, with the lower severity when a crash did occur. So I think, I think you, you're right that the speed is definitely, you know, a, a, a confounding factor. If, if I may, in terms of mitigating the sever severity, but because of the intersection, because of the interaction at the intersection, there tends to be a more opportunity for crash to occur. Th thank you very much, Vice Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, one of the uh, key items on our most wanted list is that of distraction. And uh, do we have any data relative to distraction being a causal factor in these accidents, either in the part of the drivers or on the part of the bicyclists? Well, first of all, if you look at uh, the National uh, Police Report Database, you know, which is basically what FAR is, right? FARS or even the GES, um, the variable uh, associated with distractions are very hit and miss. And it's very, very difficult to, uh, for us to actually come up with a, you know, uh, accurate and precise understanding of how much distraction is involved, even from the driver's side. Now, if you look at the bicycle personal uh, contributing factor with distraction, 
it's almost next to impossible to actually get that from the police report. So I think I think you you are probably getting get, getting to a point that you know perhaps you know something that that uh, the police crash reporting would needs to you know sort of like catch up, you know, in terms of getting to that particular fact. That to answer to 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 directly answer your question is that we were not able to to look at that, and that's because the the data issue. Well, I think if I understand kind of where Member Hamandi is going here. Um, uh, this is good as far as it goes, but I think we're sort of just scratching the surface in some of the some of the really important areas, and in terms of building uh, the support from the various constituencies, you know, it, it's we have to work a little bit more on that. And I would hope, well, I, I guess I would ask the question: So, how are we in NTSB doing? Are, are we doing anything in that regard, and in, in terms of talking to the uh, probably the bicycling group, I would say, uh, as opposed to say some of the others, and obviously the police departments. And I think the uh, the first of all, I think we 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 made it very clear that uh, in terms of you know, improving bicycling safety across the country is really required commitment from everybody, including bicyclists themselves. And, uh, but also, you know, I don't want to, you know, take all the credit, you know, for, you know, well, I probably should take all the credit for NTSB, but there are other organizations out there are actually doing a lot of work in this area. And I might point to like GHSA, which work with state and local highway safety office, Actually, a couple years ago, put together a very nice report with um, 30 different action items. Some of them go directly to bicycle activist group, bicycle uh, advocacy groups, asking for them to take the responsibility, you know, and things like that. So there are so there are lots of work outside of NTSB is, is 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 happening, and I also believe that probably our safety advocacy group here uh, at NTSB working on the distraction. A list that I sh certainly hope that that team would actually take our report and you know also work on advocacy you know in terms of bicyclists. Well, I would certainly hope that they would. Um, one of the things you mentioned is the challenge of uh, uh, cons rider conspicuity and uh, you know getting riders to wear colorful clothing, although some are perhaps more colorful than I'd like to see, but that's. Uh, Talk to us a little bit about that, and particularly uh, regards LED lighting. Uh, I've I've had the opportunity to see some bicyclists that are almost lit up like a uh, emergency vehicle, and it's really really good to draw your attention to it. Thank you for that question. Yes, I, I think that in the in the course of researching, uh, d conducting the research for this report, that was one of the interesting things that we learned was that. Um, you know, what a big difference it can make um, when a rider is using retroreflective materials or incorporating uh, lighting on the bicycle in terms of how, what, what kind of a difference that can make in terms of improving their conspicuity and reducing their risk. And so, you know, as, as I mentioned in my presentation, it's been a very long time since we've looked, since uh, the CPSC has looked at the, the types of materials that can improve conspicuity on bicycles. So it's not, it's certainly something that we would hope that they would look at, not just reflectors, but even the possibility of whether bicycle lights can be incorporated into the bicycle design itself, because we know that that is possible and that some manufacturers are doing so. Good, I'll follow up on the next round, thank you. Thank you very much, Member Hamadi. Uh, I wanted to turn to Table 7 on page 48. It's U.S. Bicyclist Fatalities and Crashes by High Fatality Crash Group from 2014 through 2016. And my understanding this is a, that you all looked at, I guess there are about 19 crash groups, but this lists um, about eight of them and uh, references uh, motorist overtaking bicyclists, bicyclists fail, failed to yield, uh, parallel pass, crossing pass, uh, bicyclists left turn, wrong way, wrong side. And what I want to, what I want to ask about is, I think this, I believe this comes from police reports, right? And to me, that seems somewhat subjective. 
and that's what I want to ask about because in a police, at a crash scene, the bicyclist is usually the one transported very quickly. The motorist is the one left at the scene. And so there's usually maybe one, maybe two witnesses at the scene. And um, it doesn't really, although the, the, the police reports I'm sure are very accurate, it doesn't um, uh, follow the progress of the accident from the time of the crash through sort of a, uh, a judicial proceeding where there might be a change in the fault of, of the specific crash. So I'm just wondering, is that data reliable? Thank you for the question. I think it's a very uh, important, important observation that you made. Um, <clears throat> so definitely in this particular table is based on police crash reports. Uh, in terms of vitality, it's a census of all the death. In terms of uh, injuries, it's a sample. It's a sample police report. You're definitely right. And this does not follow the whole, you know, even the investigative process through, through the whole process. And that's why sometimes you will see the needs of data change from, from preliminary to final. Is that in some occasions, some of those data get feedback into, into FARS. But that is not a guarantee. Um, I also want to, I also, I, I, and also agree with you, uh, in terms of fatality, you know, in terms of a failure to yield or a right away kinds of, uh, right away kind of characterization, oftentimes the, uh, well, I, wasn't, I shouldn't say oftentimes, but I think most of the time, definitely all the time, the fatally injured bicyclists are not there to defend for himself. So there might be, there is definitely some kind of subjectivity involved uh, in, the, in the characterization. Um, that's why, uh, you know, and we actually have taken a look at some, trying to kind of tease, tease out a little bit. And in fact, if even if you look at failure to yield uh, characterizations, probably about half of them are actually further coded as not obeying, you know, particular uh, 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 signals or, or, stop, or stop and things like that. Um, so definitely, I agree with you. Subjectivity is is here, and uh, that's why we make you know um, NTSB has made a long histories of you know making recommendation in police crash reporting. We ask NHTSA you know to work on mark and things like that. One more thing that I I do want to bring out and that I think I think was kind of like help you you know um, a little bit is that. Sometimes you don't even need to go as far as following the entire investigation process or judication process. I have the opportunity to look at some really detailed crash reports. FARS and GES oftentimes actually are capturing the first page of their reports. A lot of the detailed dynamics, the actual contextual information about a particular crash it's probably in the second or third page of the report, and when it never got rolled up into the national data. So I think, again, you know, I agree with actually all three of you, we're only scratching this, the surface. And um, uh, one more question before my time's up, and we'll, I'll come back with some other ones. Did, did we look at enforcement with respect to conventional and buffered bike lanes? And the reason why I'm asking that, and you know, I wish I had thought about it before, but so much was going on. But I have so many pictures of cars parked in bike lanes in DC. You know, I have one on L Street where there's a truck parked in a bike lane, which forces bi uh, bicyclists out of the bike lane back into traffic. Uh, so did we look at the role of enforcement? Uh, we did not specifically look at that issue, although, you know, during our uh, stakeholder discussion, you know, panel, and we, we talked to both uh, bicycle safety people as well as law enforcement uh, uh, community, you know, it is, a known, it is a known issue. It is not just an annoying issue, it is a safety issue. And again, unfortunately, if you think about uh, any safety, you know, reporting regarding the situation like a truck, blocking your, your roadway, even if, it's, it, even if it involves a crash, you will not be able to see that in a national database that that is the cause 
of the events because what is being quoted is going to be a bike and a, and, and a vehicle. Now, um, I did follow up with some uh, law enforcement community, uh, law enforcement officers, some of the captains, and say, hey, do you guys actually keep track of that? Keep track of citations about illegally parked car and things like that? He said, they don't. So it's, it's, it is, again, an area that is, you know, uh, probably need a lot more research. Thank you, Member Hamadi. I've studied the report, and I, I think I know the answer to this, that frankly we don't know. Uh, we don't get into correlation and causation. But it is interesting to me that in the time period in the, uh, between 2007 and 2018, bike collisions with, uh, I'm sorry, uh, uh, traffic-related fatalities decreased by 11%, but bike fatalities increased by double that amount. 22%, and between 2000, and I said this in the opening statement, between 2017 and 18, bike fatalities increased 6%, 6 6.3%, whereas crash, whereas highway fatalities overall decreased by about 2.5%. Um, any thoughts on this? I know that we, we don't get into... We can't drill down in the data uh, and find that correlation, but uh, what do you think's going on here? We saw the same thing with pedestrians. Pedestrian fatalities increased, uh, I think, 28% uh, while highway uh, fatalities overall decreased 11% in a, de in a recent decade. So what's going on? I think, um, I think there was a number of factors and I think the number one thing that I want to point out is that we really are doing a very poor job on you know, understanding exposure. Is part of it is probably there are more people walking, especially our society has become you know, more urbanized, right? And uh, um, if you look at our data over here, a lot of the you know, large city, the bicycle level, even just counting commuting are, are increasing. So there's definitely, you know, the exposure issue. There are more people biking. We are doing a poor job of accounting for that. But I think, I think that's, that could be part of, the, part of the reason. But also, for the longest time, we also have a very traditional and long commitment to protecting, protecting uh, uh, vehicle occupants, right? So a lot of technologies are there and, you know, really are doing a very good job of dramatically reducing you know, crashes as well as serious injury and fatality of the people inside the vehicle. And I think what we have done in the past couple of years is to bring the attention to the people who are outside of, outside of the vehicle. That's why we look at vulnerable road users and perhaps some other, the highway might be able to, to add to me, add to my uh, conversation. The, 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 that's okay. I mean, I never really, I mean, that's a really good answer that you gave there that we focused on increasing the survivability of people inside the, the vehicle. So that would increase, that would result for, that would account for the lower number of highway fatalities overall. Um, I can't help but to believe that these things here are part of the problem uh, that, that we have distracted drivers out there, but we, that's my intuition. But I think you, you've, you've uh, put a more scientific uh, explanation on it. Let me ask you this. Um, Sean in my office uh, talked to you about this yesterday because I was considering making an amendment. We, in, in a couple of our recommendations, we say, uh, we talk about the proven safety countermeasures and we talk about the Everyday Counts program and uh, we, we've gotten pretty specific with respect to what should be included in, in those, we say separated bike lines and intersection safety treatments. My question is, why did we just limit it there? Why didn't we say, seek proven strategies, including those two that I just mentioned? So what's, why did we just limit it to those two? I think based on the, uh, the actual research, both engineering and crash reduction type of research, then we find that you know, in terms of mid-block crashes, 
separated bike lane is probably the gold standard. And uh, improvement in the infrastructure, in improvements of intersection treatments, what has been identified in the report, those three strategies have gone through an FHWA experimentation process with tens or 15 you know, crash study that have shown that they are proven and they work. So I understand that some of the recommendation, we don't want to be prescriptive, but in this case, we truly believe that those uh, countermeasure is gonna give us a lot of uh, safety benefits. So we felt that in this case, it is necessary for us to, to recommend those specific countermeasure and make the transportation agency, if they so choose to use something else to prove that something else is better, then we, 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 we put, we put it, uh, 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 ready to put our support in those countermeasure. Thank you very much, Vice, Vice Chairman Landsberg. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Dr. Price, I wanna follow up on the conspicuity issue. Uh, it seems like it's hard to get people to uh, dress or adopt their own conspicuity, and it might be easier to get the bicycle manufacturers to start including lighting on the bikes. And I found that the bright LEDs work as well in broad daylight as they do after dark. And uh, could you talk a little bit about, you know, uh, where they are with that? And, and uh, is there any move to say, you know, as we required reflectorizing the bikes, if that's the right term, uh, in the, uh, you know, 20 or 30 years ago, uh, could we get to some place where we might say, you know, that it would be required that bicycles have some kind of LED lighting on board? Thank you. Well, yes, I think that it's, it's within the realm of possibility that that could happen um, just because of the advances in technology that they're lighter, cheaper, and easier to integrate into the, the frame of a bicycle. Um, certainly, uh, I, I do believe the CPSC is best positioned to bring the experts together to evaluate what the technologies are, what are most effective. There's a quite a wide range of different materials that are out there that could potentially be incorporated into a bicycle to improve conspicuity. So um, the recommendation that we're proposing today leaves that leeway for them to evaluate that and determine what would be the most effective way to do that, but certainly encourages them once they've done that evaluation to incorporate that into the regulations so that bicycles manufactured in the future can improve their conspicuity beyond the reflectors that we see on them today that are based on the 1980 standards. And what about retrofit? Uh, I have an old bike, uh, but uh, it's a good one, and so on. So uh, are there retrofit options available? Well, certainly. Um, you know, you can buy bicycle lights. Uh, you know, we have, we have bicyclists here who probably can speak to the, the different technologies that they've purchased to improve their safety. Um, you know, as there are things as simple as very inexpensive retro reflective materials that bicyclists can either put on their bicycle or on themselves to very, um, to increase greatly their, their conspicuity. It doesn't have to be a high tech uh, lighting system necessarily. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that we learned along the way is that um, just retroreflective materials uh, on the pedals or the feet, which is the place the motion of the bicycling motion can be the most easy to detect by other users on the road because of that bio motion that's incorporated in that. So just to put that out there, it's, it's, it's a simple thing that bicyclists mm -hmm. can do to improve their own I safety. I like that term, bio motion. Um, let, could we talk a little bit about uh, the proliferation and how that kind of fits in of uh, the electronic or electric scooters because they are just exploding and uh, where I live uh, over in Arlington, I mean, these things are all over the place. And um, so how, how do, we, we've now added something else into the mix on, on bicyclists, pedestrians, motor vehicles, and now scooters. Thank you. And, um, it sounds like you, you were expecting <laughs> this one. No, I think it's a very, uh, it's a very relevant topic. 
Um, even though at the end of our research, we decided not to focus on e-scooter, you know, the main reason is because it is not a bicycle, even though oftentimes well, it was well, thought no, it, as it's a not, bicycle. Well, right. it's not bio-motion, but it's, uh, <laughs> it, it has two right. wheels. Right. So. Well, first of all, um, I think a lot of our recommendation actually would work for e-scooter as well in terms of the infrastructure, in terms of encouraging conspicuity, and definitely wearing a helmet. Um, the reason is because um, as little that as we have learned about safety issue about e-scooter, they haven't been around for that long, even though they are exploding like there was no tomorrow. Um, our current crash and injury data collection process are not capable of teasing, teasing them out at this point. And there are organizations developing typo, typology as well as crash reporting you know, um, ability to keep track of those information. But I can tell you based on three research, um, some of the issue that they find is that definitely extremely, extremely low helmet use. That's one area that I think that our recommendation would help. Uh, number two is that surprisingly, a lot of the uh, e-scooter user, actually they never ride a bike. So there are lots of, a lot of behavior like, you know, member harmony and I know what to do if you're sharing the road might not necessarily apply with the e-scooter. So I think there is some educational component that needs to take place. Um, so the bottom line is that it is an emerging issue. It's being talked about every time I go to talk about bike safety. They don't want to talk about bike. They want to talk about e-scooter. Um, and so that's something, that's definitely something that a lot of people are paying attention to. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Chairman. Member Hamadi. Uh, I, I can ride any bike, but I don't think I could actually ride an e-scooter and be good at it. And just to your point, uh, Vice Chairman, I literally glow when I am on a bike. I think uh, um, it was a few months ago, uh, uh, another cyclist who was coming towards me said, man, can't miss you. So <laughs> I, did, I, I thought about wearing my outfit, but I didn't want to glow on the screen. Um, I do want to ask, you had pointed out, I think it was you, Dr. Chung, that 35 states recommended separated bike lanes, but only four installed them. I'm sure there are lots of reason for, reasons for that. And I'm really interested in some of the challenges that exist for traffic engineers in deciding whether to put in separated bike lanes or any other type of bike lane. So f first, can you talk about why, why only four, but then um, and then I have some follow-up to that on the traffic engineer's question. Uh, I, think, I think in terms of um, that uh, four states, and I think I'm referring to on the state, uh, on the state roadway. I mean, a lot, there, there are a whole lot more local jurisdictions that are implementing separated by lane, protected by, by way and things like that. Going back to your, the, your, your question about challenges, um, because uh, for whatever reason, um, the 2012, uh, we call it the bike guide, the, 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 um, the guidance to develop bicycle facility, even though protected bikeway or separated bike lane is a known safety countermeasure, kind of somehow was missing in the guidance documents. So it make it very difficult for transportation engineering, particularly if you are in a smaller uh, jurisdiction, if you don't have the money and the support like New York City or Washington DC, make it very difficult for, that, for the transportation engineering or, or the designer to push for a separated bike lane. And that's why it is very important for NTSB to make that recommendation to ASTRO to make sure that when the next one comes out, separated bike lane and uh, infrastructure treatments is there. So that make it easier and make it more uh, 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 pilotable, you know, for the engineer to push for that implementation. Um, so I think, I think that's uh, one of the main reasons why there are difficulty for transportation engineering pushing for, pushing for those uh, infrastructure. Yeah, and, and I was speaking with a friend of mine this weekend for, uh, uh, about some challenges for VDOT. 
and they had uh, pointed out that there were these Federal Highway Administration crash mitigation or crash management factors, and that when they look at putting in separated bike lanes or some other bike line, lane, that it actually shows, that it'll show on their um, mock-up that um, there will be more crashes and um, more fatalities and injuries with more cyclists if you put in a separated bike lane and then they have to do all these other mitigating factors to address that. So it's sometimes easier for the states to say, forget it. And so that seems to be a backwards you know, way of addressing uh, safety. Um, but sometimes they claim that's the only way that they can get the money. And later I'll hear from him, I'm sure, if I didn't get all this right. But I'm just asking you if that's something that, that yeah. you came across. Yeah, definitely. And I think one of the, even some of the people I talked to at FHWA, you know, when I try to flow the idea that uh, we, want it, we want it to be on the proof and safety countermeasure list or the EDC, one of the things that they talk about is crash modification factor. I think that's what you were referring to. And is that, you know, whether you're putting that in is going to positively or negatively impact, um, impact the, 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 the uh, crash frequency or crash rate and things like that. And I think, um, and, and that's why it's very important, you know, for, you know, even FHWA to help all this local agency to figure out a way to actually proper, proper, properly identify and figure out how to measure the level of uh, uh, basic activity. Because oftentimes you're just counting the number of people on that improved bikeway, but then uh, or, or, or number of people that were that could be uh, involved in a crash. But what you have forgotten is that the number of people who are using that facility have been significantly uh, uh, increased. So that's why it's very critical for every um and other researcher that they work with to make sure that they understand that, they make sure that that's the right way to evaluate it. And as a matter of fact, you know, to get it onto the uh, Proven Safety Countermeasure Initiative or the EDC, there is going to be a very rigorous you know, process to identify all the research that have actually shown, and I think that we laid it out for FXW already, you know, with their own work, that I think that it would be something that they, they should be able to uh, accomplish, and it will help your friends at VDOT or, you know, whichever um, DOT to actually make a stronger case for implementing those, uh, those improvements. Thank you very much. Yeah, Member Hamadi, thank you. And uh, for the record, I'd say you always glow. So, oh, yeah, you. yes, and, and of course. I wasn't going to touch that one. Well, yeah. Um, I mean that as a compliment. So, okay, all right. Um, and just for clarification, something that the vice chairman said, uh, just because uh, something has two wheels. So we really, this, the focus of this study, the scope of this study is truly pedocyclists. Is that correct? Uh, yes, definitely. It's a pedocyclist. And we struggle at the beginning of this research. Is that what term do we use? Do we use cycle, pedocycle, or bicyclist? We look at the FAR data, look at the GS data. You know, um, the, there were two quotes. And I'm going to bore you with the detail. You know, code number six and seven. And seven is relating to unicycles or tricycle, you know, and things like that. 99.5% of crashes are involving bicycle. So I think we were comfortable using the term bicycle to accomplish everything. Great. But of course, we do. Our data and recommendations would also apply to tricycles and unicycles. Very good. Thank you. Um, I am interested in hearing more about the. Uh, the collision avoided systems, I'm sorry, actually not collision avoided systems, but like the, the V to P uh, sort of systems. Dr. Price, would you be willing to uh, uh, shed some light on that? I know you've already talked about it, but. Oh, certainly. Um, so, so as I mentioned in my presentation, we use the term V to P, which sounds like it's vehicle to pedestrian, but uh, the way the Department of Transportation has defined it, the the systems are broad and would encompass use by bicyclists and other road users, you know, people in wheelchairs or using other mobility devices. Um, the basic idea is 
you know, you've, you're probably familiar with V2V, which is the idea of vehicles that can communicate with one another using short-range radio communication or cellular communications. Um, adding the, the V2P element is that a system that would allow, uh, you know, rapid communication between vehicles and pedestrians through infrastructure or directly. And so traditionally, the way this is being conceived as the research progresses is through, for example, a cell phone or a cell phone app, because many of us now carry cell phones. Although it doesn't have to be, it could be a transponder on the bicycle itself. Um, so the idea would be when uh, that, a, that a bicyclist or a, or a motorist could get information about an impending collision or other information. So for example, uh, from s information from signals that would help them to be more aware of their environment, especially when visibility is limited, so that they could take steps to avoid a collision. Fantastic, and of course we'll be talking about more aspects of that in two weeks when we get into a, a board meeting right here, dealing with a, uh, a car, an Uber vehicle being operated in, the, uh, in a testing sort of a mode that did not detect a pedestrian who was pushing a bicycle. So, uh, so it, it is uh, fascinating what technology may be out there. Uh, I yield the balance of my time, Vice Chairman. Well, I have just uh, one more question which may or may not be easy to answer. Um, what few things could uh, bicyclists do to uh, optimize their safety? As I said, it may not yes. be easy to answer, but it's it's it's, it's it, it can be both. And I think, but I mean, speaking from a personal perspective as a cyclist, and I always pride myself as being as predictable as possible, and being predictable as a bicycle is meaning that I really should follow the road rule. There's no doubt about it. I mean, there was a the reason for. The reason for traffic rule, and one of the main reasons in terms of vulnerable road user is that be predictable. So therefore, the driver know what to expect when you are sharing the road with a bicyclist. Number two, also, I would say is definitely take your own safety as serious as possible, meaning that just in case, if you get into a crash, unfortunately, you do the best you can to protect yourself. And the, 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 the big piece of equipment on your body is your head. So that's why I think it's very important for us to remember a cyclist should at least voluntarily put a, head, uh, put a helmet on your, on your head. I think those two are probably a very, very important uh, component in terms of personal responsibility. Very good. Thank you. And I will yield the balance of my time. Thank you very much, Vice Chairman. Member Hamadi. Uh, and uh, Dr. Price. I think it's you. Uh, in finding 17, we focus on blind spots in large vehicles, but um, I can tell you from personal experience, I had a Prius, and there was I could not, in certain at certain points, actually see a pedestrian at a crosswalk or see an entire bicycle. Um, so I'm wondering why uh, we just focus on large vehicles, because there are certainly blind spots in on all sorts of vehicles. Thanks. Uh, yes, I think I can address why we made our original uh, recommendations in 2013 and 2014. They were made under the auspices of a, a study that we conducted on single unit trucks, and the researcher who was looking at it at the time observed that uh, large vehicles, that about a quarter of uh, pedestrian and bicyclist fatalities uh, would were occurred from an impact from the side of large trucks. Um, and comparatively with uh, smaller vehicles, it was closer to around 5%. So certainly large vehicles, the risk is disproportionate. And we can, you know, just from, from for example, the image you saw in my presentation, we know that, that large vehicles, large trucks have large blind spots. That said, I think you are making a great point that it doesn't mean that small vehicles do not have blind spots. And blind spot detection systems are an important piece of the puzzle. And at the time when we made the 2013 and 2014 recommendations, even then blind spot detection systems were making their way into the passenger vehicle fleet. And they have grown since then. Um, 
I looked during the course of this study to see that um, a large majority of passenger vehicles now offer blind spot detection systems as either an option or a standard um, system on vehicles. And uh, NHTSA, in both their 2013 and their 2015 um, notice about the considerations that they're thinking of making to the new car assessment program, mentioned that they were considering incorporating blind spot detection systems into it. And in each case, the NTSB wrote back and, and spoke favorably about that incorporation and about the incorporation of advanced vehicle technologies into the NCAP. Well, I think that's a, uh, a perfect segue into my question about what information is currently incorporated into the five-star uh, rating for cars in the U.S. and how does that differ from Euro NCAP? And what recommendations have we issued to improve the U.S. NCAP that would be beneficial to bicycling safety? So, thank you. The NCAP system, uh, most people know of it as the Stars on Cars program. So, when you go to buy a new car, there's a sticker. It's got, you see some stars that rate the safety of your vehicle. Um, the, the new car assessment program in the United States, which has been around for 40 years, currently looks at uh, crashworthiness and occupant protection in a variety of different crash scenarios to create those star ratings. So they're looking at driver um, and other occupant safety and crash tests. By contrast, um, it, if you look at, for example, Euro NCAP, you'll see that they have advanced uh, considerably beyond what the, the United States NCAP does. They look at um, not, just occupant, not just occupant protection, but they look specifically at child occupant protection. They also look at vulnerable road user protection in the event of a crash. And finally, they have a, a, a component of the rating that incorporates crash prevention and safety assist systems. So they have, uh, and they have continuously updated it over the years, whereas we have not yet, we haven't seen a change in the US NCAP, a significant change in, in a decade. Thank you. And um, uh, just to, well, with that in mind, uh, new research from uh, AAA revealed that uh, automatic, automatic emergency braking systems with pedestrian detection perform inconsistently and prove to be completely ineffective at night, which is why I'm guessing we actually need some of the, uh, we actually, I'm guessing your response would be that's why we need NCAP because. <laughs> we have to have some sort of rating of these systems. Is that right? Yeah, I, well, I think that there are two things to consider. Number one is that uh, in the current environment, uh, you know, motorists need to know that just because you're, the car you've purchased has such a system on it doesn't mean that that system may function in every single situation. So it's always important for drivers to be continuously aware and scanning for pedestrians in their environment. But just as you pointed out, yes, this is exactly why um, I think these systems are great and have a lot of promise, and I, I hope to see them continue to develop and be placed on vehicles. But we want to know which ones are working. And we, and as both as people in, interested in, our, in safety and as consumers, it's, it's very important to be able to know whether these systems not are just there, but are they performing as designed? Great, thank you. I, I, have, I have more questions, but... Um. Um, please, please continue. Oh, okay. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, speeding is on the NTSB Most Wanted list and an issue that I'm uh, very interested in. Uh, has there been any progress in the recommendations we issued in 2017 that are relevant to bicyclist safety? Thank you for that question, and I think is, is, as I mentioned earlier, speed, excessive speed, speedings are an important issue in vulnerable road user. And I think um, in terms of the safety recommendation that we made in 2017, um, there are some progress, and there are you know, lots of open, acceptable uh, uh, recommendations out there as well, especially to NHTSA or some, some of them. Uh, to Nitsa. But I want to point out that the most relevant one is associated with how we uh, rethink uh, the 85th percentile, uh, 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 a way of setting, setting speed limits. Unfortunately, um, the National Committee on uh, the, the 
The MUTCD, the national, board, the national committee that work on MUTCD, make recommendation to FHWA, have actually taken up our recommendation, and they have actually approved a change to the MUTCD language to de-emphasize the 85th percentiles. And that will give a tool to a lot of local community where speeding is, is an important issue to them. And now the next step is for FHWA to act on it. And um, so I think that would be probably the most relevant to uh, bicycle safety. Well, and I think it's important. And can you talk a little bit about the 85th percentile we have? I'm sure we have people who are watching online. It's a, it's a crucial issue. And I think because of that, we've seen ratcheting up of speed limits in different states. And so why don't you just talk about it a little bit more? Sure, my favorite subject, 85th percentile speed. Um, so, so the 85th percentile speaks is, you know, sort of like a rule of thumbs for a lot of transportation or traffic engineering for the long, long time. And so when we were looking at the speeding study and we talked to engineer and say, oh, you know, if someone come to you and want to change the speed limits, you know, what do you do? Walk us through the process. Say, well, we do a, we do a speed survey and then we found the 85th percentile and that basically, you know, would gauge whether the speed needs to go up or go down. Uh, the reason behind that is because there is a strong belief that driver is prudent and driver know what best, you know, in terms of, of their own safety. So therefore, you know, when you allow people to drive the way that they do in a, in a roadway, and that become a statistical issue, that 85th percentile tends to be considerably higher than the speed limit. So that's go to your, your issue about, you know, things get creeping up and creeping up. Yeah, I mean, I can tell you, I drive uh, six, 60 miles each way on I-95 um, to and from my house. And, you know, I had a speech last night and I said 65 on the HOV lanes in Virginia is merely a suggestion if you did uh, the 85th percentile on I-95, I'm guessing you would probably go up to 70 or 75 at some point. And that's what we've seen in a number of the states where they have gone up and we have states that are at, you know, uh, at or above 80 miles per hour now. Um, the, other, the, the other thing to add on to your observation is that it sort of like work the, work the opposite way as well, right? So when there is a local community that notice that excessive speed and an issue, that they might have to get permission to lower the speed limits. And if the philosophy is the 85th percentile, they will never be able to do that. So I think that's uh, our recommendations are pushing, you know, the philosophy to a, to a different way of thinking about how speed limits should be set. And I think that's a very relevant point to bicycle safety. Thank you. Um, just want to make, oh, okay. Um, and there are uh, efforts by vision, and I, I want to I want to turn to um, helmets. I brought my helmet. Um, you want it? You want it? Don't you? I do. Yeah. Okay. Um, the there are initiatives like Vision Zero, uh, which have focused on roadway infrastructure, which I think is actually. Uh, extremely important. I will tell you in 2014, I was in a, um, uh, uh, I mean, I'd say a crash. It was by myself as, as a, the, the issue was roadway infrastructure at the time. And uh, I was severely in, injured for a number of years. But um, what I'm trying to figure out, is, and roadway infrastructure is important to address, but do, do initiatives like Vision Zero also focus on things like helmet use? Great questions. I think in general, Vision Zero is taking on this safe system approach, right? It's come from Sweden. The safe system approach, meaning everybody take part into the overall system safety in the transportation safety. So individual driver, vulnerable road user themselves are part of part of the equation. Now, if you look at Vision Zero strategy, you might not be able to find bicycle helmets as sort of like high on the agenda, but Vision Zero does bring in 
all kinds of uh, advocacy groups together. And some of those groups are part of the Vision Zero partner, but they are engaged in bicycle safety and they engage in bicycle helmets. As an example, New York City have Vision Zero, New York City. And one of the things that they do is actually uh, promote helmet use by distributing helmets. And so I think that's, uh, that, is an, that is an activity that Vision Zero partner with some of the cities are engaging in. Um, so I think, I think uh, that's, that's it. <laughs> Good. And um, just to reiterate uh, the point, um, what's the leading cause of bicycle-related deaths? Cause is uh, motor vehicle crashes. Or and, uh, and in terms of the injury mechanisms, you know, uh, involving motor vehicles, um, there are more head, head injury, they're more severe, and so, so that's why the recommendation we make is to somehow increase the helmet use across the board. And we recommend uh, convening a bicycle safety coalition of stakeholders to develop a comprehensive national strategy to increase bicycle helmet use among bicyclists of all ages, or that's what we're considering, and then disseminating the strategy to all states. Um, and that recommendation would be uh, for NHTSA. Who would make up this coalition? I think we that you would envision. Uh, definitely, you know, um, both public health people, um, safety researcher, uh, bicycle safety advocates, bicycle ad advocates, uh, transportation engineering, engineering designer, and the most important part is probably the law enforcement, law enforcement community. Because you know, when they do put together a model law how do we implement that law requires a lot of support from the law enforcement community. I think that the coalition need to listen to the law, and law enforcement community. Uh, I brought up the bicycle advocacy, advocacy group mm -hmm. you know, into this coalition and is bec because there is a uh, concern among them about the reductions of bicycling uh, activity. And I think that that is a concern that needs to be taken into consideration and the coalitions with the leadership from, uh, from, from NHTSA should uh, take that into consideration when they develop a strategy as well as the model law. So, so it, it's, it's pretty encompassing. And I forgot, sorry, you know, just one more thing I want to, uh, I want to add is probably micromobility provider, you know, bike share operator and things like that. So that needs to be part of the equation as well. Um, and one recommendation on including the model all ages bicycle helmet law and countermeasures that work. So why did we go with that instead of requiring uh, the, the requiring use of helmets? I think, uh, first of all, the ultimate goal is to put more helmets on people's heads regarding, regardless of the age. And we do believe that some of some state, state recommendations are very effective. In this case, because of the various reasons that we identified you know, through our stakeholder interview and things like that, uh, we believe that it is necessary to gather that support from advocacy group, and NHTSA can do that with the model legislation. So now state and jurisdiction, if they so choose, will have the national leadership, the strategy, and a model law that they can adopt and that would increase the chances for them to take up that initiative to pass a, a, a legisla legislation. And you, when, you, when you mention buy-in from the other stakeholders, you're refer referring to the statement in the report about how some believe that the mandatory use of bicycle helmets will result in less use of, of bicycles, correct? Say that's probably the most uh, most important concern that they raise, you know, during our uh, interview process. Um, yeah, I, I, I would say that's probably the, the most important concern that that they have raised. Okay, thank you, thank you. Uh, any further questions? 
We've got a number of uh, findings and recommendations to go over, and I have a feeling we'll be debating a recommendation. So, uh, so why don't we take a 10-minute uh, break? Let's come back at uh, 12:30. By that clock, we're in recess.
Looks like we're about to get everybody back in, so we'll start in about a minute. Okay, we're back in session, so Mr. Sledzik, if you'd please read the proposed findings. Yes, sir. So as a result of this study, staff has proposed 23 findings. Number one, current available data likely underestimate the level of bicycling activity in the United States. Number two, combining traditional and innovative data collection approaches could improve measures of bicycling activity. Number three, Police crash report data likely underestimate the scope of bicyclist non-fatal injuries. Number four, bicycle crashes involving motor vehicles at mid-block locations are more likely to result in fatal and serious injuries for the bicyclists. Number five, separated bike lanes could prevent bicycle crashes involving motor vehicles at mid-block locations and thereby also reduce the number of fatalities and serious injuries associated with such crashes. Number six, combining proven countermeasures to improve bicyclist safety at intersection and mid-block locations can create a network of safer roadways for bicyclists. Number seven, consolidating guidance concerning separated bike lanes, intersection treatments, and the transition between them may increase the implementation of separated bike lanes by transportation planning and engineering practitioners. Number eight, reducing traffic speeds can improve bicycle safety by reducing the likelihood of fatal or serious injury in the event of a crash. Number nine, the road diet is a proven safety countermeasure that both reduces traffic speeds and provides space on the roadway for the implementation of bicycle facilities such as separated bike lanes. Number 10, including separated bike lanes and intersection safety treatments in the Federal Highway Administration's Proven Safety Countermeasures Initiative and Everyday Counts program could help accelerate their adoption and improve bicyclist safety. Number 11, improving bicycle conspicuity may reduce the likelihood of collisions between bicycles and motor vehicles. Number 12, the existing requirements for bicycle conspicuity established in 1980 are outdated and do not adequately reflect modern advances in bicycle conspicuity materials and technologies. Number 13, revising Federal Motor Vehicle Safety Standard 108 to allow adaptive headlight systems and to require evaluating headlights in real world settings rather than in a laboratory would likely result in headlights that improve driver's ability to detect other road users, including bicyclists. Number 14, collision avoidance system technologies could be modified to detect bicycles, which would likely reduce the incidence of collisions between motor vehicles and bicycles and mitigate injuries caused by collisions when they occur. Number 15, the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration's delays in updating the new car assessment program have likely slowed the development of important safety systems for vulnerable road users and their implementation into the vehicle fleet. Number 16, the U.S. Department of Transportation's slow progress in developing standards for connected vehicle technology has delayed the implementation of potentially life-saving technology. Number 17, the larger blind spots of large vehicles make it more difficult for their drivers to detect vulnerable road users. Number 18, there continues to be a need for performance standards to ensure blind spot detection systems are capable of detecting vulnerable road users, including bicyclists. Number 19, head injury is the leading cause of bicycle related deaths and bicyclists involved in crashes with motor vehicles sustain a higher portion of head injuries. Number 20, the bicycle helmets provide effective protection and mitigate head injuries in the event of a crash. Number 21, the underutilization of bicycle helmets has contributed to the incidence of deaths 
and serious injuries among crash-involved bicyclists. Number 22, requiring helmet use is the most effective means for increasing helmet use and reducing bicyclist head injuries. And lastly, 23, a comprehensive strategy that includes both helmet legislation and complementary non-legislative interventions is most likely to increase overall helmet use among bicyclists of all ages. Mr. Slenzik, thank you very much. Uh, is there a motion to adopt the findings as proposed? So moved. Second. It's been moved by the Vice Chairman, seconded by Member Homedy. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor of adopting the findings as proposed, please signal with a hand and say aye. Aye. Opposed, there are uh, opposed, there are none. So the findings have been adopted unanimously. Uh, Mr. Sledzik, if you'd please read the proposed recommendations. Yes, sir. As a result of this study, staff proposes 11 new safety recommendations. The first one is to the Intelligent Transportation System Joint Program Office, and the recommendation is, in collaboration with the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration and the Federal Highway Administration, expand vehicle to pedestrian research efforts to ensure that bicyclists and other vulnerable road users will be incorporated into the safe deployment of connected vehicle systems. And there are several to the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration. First one, incorporate into the new car assessment program tests to evaluate a car's ability to avoid crashes with bicycles. Next, in collaboration with the Intelligent Transportation System Joint Program Office and the Federal Highway Administration, expand vehicle to pedestrian research efforts to ensure that bicyclists and other vulnerable road users will be incorporated into the safe deployment of connected vehicle systems. And next is a, a multi-part recommendation. First, convene a bicycle safety coalition of stakeholders to develop a comprehensive national strategy to increase, increase bicycle helmet use among bicyclists of all ages that would include, at a minimum, a model all ages bicycle helmet law. And the second part is disseminate the strategy to all states and make it available on your website. And the last recommendation to NHTSA, after safety recommendation four, the previous recommendation is completed, include the model all ages bicycle helmet law in countermeasures that work, a highway safety countermeasure guide for state highway safety offices. Next set of recommendations is to the Federal Highway Administration. Uh, this recommendation is a multi-part, first one. Uh, develop methods to combine traditional and innovative bicycle counting approaches that capture bicycling activity data generated by bicyclists and bike share options. And the second part is disseminate the methods to state transportation departments. Next recommendation uh, is include separated bike lanes and intersection safety treatments on the list of proven safety countermeasures. And the last and next recommendation is include separated bike lanes and intersection safety treatments in the Everyday Counts program. And the last recommendation to that group is in collaboration with the Intelligent Transportation System Joint Program Office and the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, expand vehicle to pedestrian research efforts to ensure that bicyclists and other vulnerable road users will be incorporated into the safe deployment of connected vehicle systems. The next recommendation is to the U.S. Consumer Product Safety Commission. Uh, conduct an evaluation to determine whether bicycle conspicuity could be improved by modifying the requirements described in Title 16, Code of Federal Regulations 1512.16, and if so, revise the regulation accordingly. And the last recommendation is to the American Association of State Highway and Transportation Officials. And that reads, include geometric design guidance materials on separated bike lanes, intersection treatments, and the transition between them in the next revision of the Guide for the Development of Bicycle Facilities. Okay, and will you also, uh, Mr. Sledzik, uh, discuss the previously issued recommendations reiterated in this report? I certainly will, sir. So we have 10 reiterated safety recommendations from this report and they are all to the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration. First recommendation is recommendation H13-11, and that reads, develop performance standards for visibility enhancement systems to compensate for blind spots in order to improve the ability of drivers of single unit trucks with gross vehicle weight ratings of over 10,000 pounds 
to detect vulnerable road users, including pedestrians and cyclists in their travel paths. And that recommendation is currently classified as open, unacceptable response. Next recommendation is H1312. Once the performance standards requested in H13-11 have been developed, require newly manufactured single unit trucks with gross vehicle weight ratings over 10,000 pounds to be equipped with visibility enhancement systems meeting the performance standards. And this recommendation is cur currently classified as open unacceptable response. H1330, which reads, develop minimum performance standards for connected vehicle technology for all highway vehicles. This recommendation is currently classified as open, unacceptable response. H1331, once minimum performance standards for connected vehicle technology are developed, require this technology to be installed on all newly manufactured highway vehicles. And this recommendation is also classified as open, unacceptable response currently. H1401 is require newly manufactured truck tractors with gross vehicle weight ratings over 26,000 pounds be equipped with visibility enhancement systems to improve the ability of drivers of tractor trailers to detect passenger vehicles and vulnerable road users, including pedestrians, cyclists, and motorcyclists. This recommendation is also classified as open unacceptable response. H1506, expand the new car assessment program five star rating system to include a scale that rates the performance of forward collision avoidance systems. This recommendation is cur currently classified as open acceptable response. H1507, once the rating scale described in safety recommendation H1506 is established, include the ratings of forward collision avoidance systems on the vehicle Monroney labels. This recommendation is also classified as open acceptable response currently. H18-39, revised Federal Motor Vehicle Safety Standard 108 to include performance-based standards for vehicle headlight systems correctly aimed on the road and tested on vehicle to account for headlight height and lighting performance. This recommendation is currently classified as open unacceptable response. H18-40 is revised Federal Motor Vehicle Safety Standard 108 to allow adaptive headlight systems. This recommendation is currently classified as open, acceptable response. And the last reiterated, reiterated recommendation is 18-43, which reads, incorporate pedestrian safety systems, including pedestrian collision avoidance systems and other more passive safety systems into, into the new car assessment program. And this recommendation is currently classified as open, acceptable response. Mr. Sledzik, thank you for reading those uh, uh, recommendations. I think we have uh, an amendment, uh, um, and that would be uh, a recognized member, Hamadi. Uh, and uh, I offer a motion to add the following safety recommendation to the National Highway I'm, I'm sorry, to the 50 states, District of Columbia and Puerto Rico, and that is require that all persons shall wear an age-appropriate bicycle helmet while riding a bicycle. It would not eliminate the two uh, to NHTSA. It would add on uh, to the existing recommendations on helmet use. Okay, there's a motion. Is there a second? I'll second. I'll second. It's been moved and seconded. Uh, discussion? Yep. Um, I, th I think you guys did a fantastic job with this report. I think it is lacking from uh, a agency whose mission is focused on safety, a requirement for helmet use. And let me start by um, just highlighting a few things in the report. Uh, we have about 16 pages in the report dedicated, de dedicated to uh, miti mitigating head injury and the use of helmets. And so just a few things I want to highlight. In the event of, a, we state, in the event of a crash, the most effective method, this is on page 93, for a bicyclist to mitigate head injury is to properly wear a bicycle helmet. Research has consistently shown that head injury is the leading cause of bicycle-related deaths. On page 96, we have finding 19, which says the NTSB concludes that head injury is the leading cause of bicycle-related deaths, and bicycles involved in crashes with motor vehicles sustain a higher proportion of head injuries. On page 97, we state 
we talk about some analyses on uh, mitigating head injury and the effectiveness of helmets, and we state that the analyses reported that bicycle helmets were effective at reducing head injury. For, and we state that one in particular analyzed 55 studies from 12 countries conducted between 1989 and 2017 and found that bicycle helmets reduced the likelihood of all head injuries by 48% serious head injuries by 60%, and traumatic brain injuries by 53%. And then on page 100, we highlight the CDC's uh, uh, identification of bicycle helmets as an effective intervention for all bicyclists, regardless of age. In fact, I pulled up the CDC website, and it does state bicycle helmets reduce the risk of head and brain injuries in the event of a crash. And we conclude there that bicycle helmets provide effective protection and mitigate head injuries in the event of a crash, and that is finding uh, number 20. On page uh, 103, we highlight uh, mandatory helmet requirements. And we talk about in 2018, it's a determined that among the 12 bicycle safety countermeasures it evaluated, bicycle helmet laws for children were the most effective behavioral countermeasure, and bicycle helmet laws for adults were the second most effective. Uh, we talk about how as of March 2019, 21 states in DC have laws requiring young bicyclists to wear helmets, and no states have mandatory helmet requirements for bicyclists of all ages. But we do talk about some municipalities that do have requirements, and I will get to that. But I do want to um, uh, point out NHTSA in uh, Countermeasures at Work, Chapter 9, Bicycle Safety, uh, says the purpose of bicycle helmet laws is to reduce the number of severe and fatal injuries resulting from bicycle crashes. And NHTSA says several studies show helmet laws of all ages produce higher helmet wearing rates. So then uh, if you turn to page 105 of our report, we, we have finding 22, thereby the Therefore, the NTSB concludes that requiring helmet use is the most effective means for increasing helmet use and reducing bicyclist head injuries. On 106, we state the NTSB analysis of jurisdictions in Washington, and there were a number of jurisdictions. With all ages, bicycle helmet laws indicated that local laws were successful at increasing the likelihood of helmet use among bicyclists of all ages in those jurisdictions. And then we finally talk about uh, the strategy to increase helmet use of all bicyclists, and we talk about um, how uh, engagement events with the public is crucial, but that we also need to supplement that with legislative mandates for helmet laws. So the links between education and outreach events that encourage voluntary helmet use and improvements in bicyclist safety are not as well established as the research showing that helmet laws are associated with increases in helmet use. And we conclude in finding 23 that we need a comprehensive strategy that includes uh, helmet legislation. So um, I, I, I highlight those, but I also, you know, I, I understand that there are concerns with among some in the bicycle community, uh, and then there are advocates in the bicycle safety community for. Uh, helmets, but in the bicycling community, there are uh, concerns with uh, expressed that this could reduce the number of bicyclists. And I would love to see um, uh, more people out of their cars and riding bikes. That'd be fantastic. But the NTSB's mission is not about bicycle use. Our mission is safety. It's the National Transportation Safety Board. And our, our goal is zero deaths, zero injuries, and zero crashes. And the way we go about doing that is by issuing recommendations that prevent crashes, that prevent injuries, and that save lives. And so I, I want, over the course of the last 52 years since we were created in 1967, we have taken extraordinary measures to improve transportation safety. And a lot of that is 
because of your work and the rest of the dedicated staff at the NTSB, and you should be congratulated for that. But just to highlight what some of those are, I mean, I, I saw a picture of myself uh, I actually didn't know this picture existed, when I was maybe 10 years old in the back of a station wagon, basically standing up. I'm sure that station wagon was actually moving at the time. It was the 70s. There's not, there wasn't a lot of safety belt usage. Now, we wouldn't even, most people wouldn't even think about not wearing a safety, uh, safety belt. Of course we would put our seat belt on. And, we, and it's beginning to even shift in the, in the rear seat where people are, you know, it used to be, why would I wear a seat belt in the rear seat? Well, of course we would wear it now. And we know the dangers of not wearing the seat belts. And the NTSB um, uh, 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 issued recommendations and have issued recommendations to the states on seat belt use uh, numerous times. In fact, the first state that adopted um, uh, seatbelt law was in 1984. Um, now we have 34 states plus the DC, plus DC with some, some part of, uh, whether it was partial or full uh, seatbelt laws. And you know, one thing that we had uh, found um, was, uh, it, it was actually in one of our safety recommendations, and um, a, a, it's dated June 20th, 1995, to the District of Columbia, and I'm sure to other states. Um, but we stayed in here, for ex when the safety board expressed strong support for the passage of mandatory restraint use laws in its 1988 safety study on the performance of lap shoulder belts, 31 states in the District of Columbia had such laws leaving 19 states that didn't. So during the next three years, seven of the remaining 19 states enacted mandatory restraint use laws after we advocated for lap shoulder belts. Consequently, in 1991, the safety board recommended that the remaining 12 states enact legislation that would require occupants of all passenger automobiles, vans, and light trucks to use lap shoulder belt systems in the seating positions equipped with such belts. Because of the importance of this issue, the board placed this recommendation on its most wanted list, and by March 1994, 10 additional states had enacted mandatory use laws. And we stayed in here today, 48 states in DC have uh, mandatory restraint use laws. And that's where I feel like, that's the power of the NTSB. We set the safety bar, and we are the ones who affect change. It's, it's because of our work, because of your work, that we have seatbelt laws, that we have issued numerous times, and we're not gonna stop since 1975, for lap shoulder belts in buses. And we last did it in Concan. In fact, we have a recommendation to Denali National Park to add uh, 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 lap shoulder belts on some of their buses. Uh, and now what's happening, school districts are starting to purchase buses with lap shoulder belts because of our work. We have recommendations on car seats booster seats. We have recommendations for the air on, uh, and not just in cars, but for, for using your car seat on an airplane. And now we see people get, and now it's recommended by the FAA on their website, and you see people getting on and putting their uh, children in car seats. And the reason we do that is because we are told to secure our most, our things on an airplane, yet we're not told to secure our most vulnerable and most precious uh, uh, passengers, which are our children. Uh, we have motorcycle laws, um, and I know that, you know, there's some discussion, uh, helmet laws, and I know there's some discussion where that, that was stymied at some point, but we are st starting to see progress. We saw some progress with the state of Connecticut this year where we testified on uh, motorcycle helmets. 49 states in DC have some form of a cell phone uh, uh, ban law or texting law. And the most important recommendations we've made to states recently are on 0.05, where we have estimated that about 1,700 uh, deaths would be prevented by reducing 0.08 to 0.05. Utah 
first state, also the first state that went from 0.10 to 0.08, followed by hopefully soon and under consideration, Michigan, New York, California. These are all things that we recommended because we took uh, that, um, that stance. And so when we talk about safety leadership, sometimes it's taking the important step of just setting the high bar on safety. And so what I don't want to see is another 47 years go by and we haven't taken that step. Now, I understand you want you know, a bicycle safety coalition to get together and talk about a, a, a model law. And you want the model law put in the countermeasures that work. That can still be done. In fact, if states want to respond to our, require, our, our calls for requiring uh, helmets, they can say that work is being done. We can keep it open and uh, open acceptable until the time that that model legislation is available to them. And I think that would be a standard if we see that movement on the stakeholder community and the model legislation. So with that, I know I've talked forever and I'm so sorry. I'm very passionate about bicycle safety. So thank you very much for your time. Well, I, t I told you, you, uh, you glowed and you shine also. So uh, great job. Thank you, Vice Chairman. I have to say, uh, and I told Member Hamandi, I was struggling with this one a little bit because of the, uh, uh, well, first off, there's the perception of the nanny state. Uh, there's also, uh, well, we're Americans and we're independent and we don't like folks telling us what to do, particularly from Washington. Um, I think there is complete agreement on the fact that helmets do work. They are absolutely effective. Uh, you've stated that, and Member Hamandi has seconded multiple times uh, that this is the case. Um, I think staff has uh, attempted to uh, provide a process by which we get to uh, the ultimate state within the engagement of the various groups and sort of the socializing, if you will, uh, to get this here. And um, one of the challenges that I always struggle with is how we balance, you know, obviously the perfect being the enemy of the good, which I say entirely too often. I think if we are realistic in our expectations, um, I see no harm in, in proceeding as Member Hamandi has recommended. Uh, I frequently talk about being talked out of my tree, and I think in this case uh, she has been successful. I don't want you to get used to this, but... Uh, <laughs> Yeah, yeah, but uh, I think uh, I think there's merit in what she says, and as long as we understand and convey, which we can't do just in a two-line recommendation, but in our, our discussions with the various groups, that this is the goal that we wish to accomplish. So with that, Mr. Chairman, I will stop. Well, thank you. I came in uh, to the meeting not sure. Um, because I do worry that we will be perceived as, oh my goodness, here comes the NTSB again. Um, that p potentially every time we find a problem, we would issue a law to the states. Um, I have supported 0.05. I've supported motorcycle helmets. I have supported the require state laws for child seats. I've supported NTSB recommendations calling for an, uh, an outright ban on the non-emergency non use of cell phones and that states should enact those laws. I've supported recommendations for primary seatbelt usage. The state should require those. And I've certainly supported the notion of states adopting a requirement for lap shoulder belts in school buses. This one, I think it started out as a cultural issue for me. I grew up uh, a few years ago. Well, actually, I never really grew up. Don't ever do that. No, don't ever do that. But, um, you know, I, I grew up jumping on a bicycle and, and riding it and uh, never thought about wearing a helmet. Uh, on the other hand, I grew up getting into an automobile, never with the notion of not buckling a seat belt. Um, so 
I do worry about it, you know, the, no, the notion of a nanny state, but I also agree um, that it is up to the NTSB to set that bar. Um, if we don't, who will? People do look to us, and uh, in talking to Sean about this over the last few weeks, when it comes to, um, that's another thing I've supported, is uh, graduated driver licensing laws. Back when I was supporting that and advocating that, I would say that, the, that people turn to the law for guidance. But I, but I, 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 I so I've kind of struggled with this. But um, you know, I, I thought about this. So, do we require helmets on skateboarders or helmets on people riding scooters? I used to ride horses. I always wore a helmet. But I did a Google search. About a hundred people a year die on horses, falling off of horses. Do we require people riding horses to to wear helmets? We pointed out here, and we've adopted a finding that says that the greatest intervention strategy for preventing the accident is what? Is increased contiguity. So should we pass a, a requirement? Because we all know that it's better to prevent the crash than to try to mitigate the injuries. If we can prevent it, then we don't have to worry about mitigating the injuries. So do we, why don't we, when we get through with this one, maybe I'll propose a recommendation that we require people to wear reflective clothing. Where does it stop? Well, number one, I, I just in response to that, our job is not just to prevent a crash. Our job is to save lives. And obviously, we have recommendations on preventing a crash and we, when we look at investigations and we consider uh, recommendations as a result of those investigations, our work is being done to prevent crashes. And those are recommendations that we hope the agencies and others will implement. But it's also our job to prevent injuries and to save lives. And we have laid out in 16 pages of this report that that is exactly what helmets can do. And that's been known since the 1980s. But there's nobody who has issued a recommendation, and we haven't because we have not studied bicycle safety for 47 years, on uh, helmet use. And so I, I, I also rode horses, and I definitely wore a helmet when I rode horses. But we're talking about transportation here that is under our just jurisdiction, and our jurisdiction is motor vehicles, uh, and in this case, we're looking at bicycles and vulnerable road users. And we've had a series of safety studies, whether it's pedestrians, motorcycles, and, we ha and now bicyclists, and we have really strong recommendations, and I think it would be an absolute shame and probably a shock to, to anyone looking at our uh, our fantastic report that after 16 pages, we don't, in the end, um, uh, recommend the adoption of laws to um, uh, re uh, require helmet use. So I will note that part of our job is to prevent accidents. One of our little slogans that I've seen over the years is preventing accidents, reducing injuries, and saving lives. So. Uh, how many how many people here would support a notion to require reflective um, gear? No, nobody really would support that. Let me ask you this. Uh, I, I, yeah. So the question was, how many people here on the no uh, would would report? Well, maybe we should clarify: is that uh, at night or all the time? Well, you know, we'd have to debate that one <laughs> for a little while too. But I would say all the time. Um, so here's here's the deal. Um, I want to hear one more time, because as I was reading the report, through reading through these 16 pages, and reading the findings, I'm expecting a recommendation to all states to adopt requirements for helmet use. So tell, tell us one more time 
why staff chose to go this direction, because you sure teed it up. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity for uh, putting my two words in. Um, <clears throat> I think it's very important to recognize that uh, Member Harmondy did a fantastic job of summarizing you know, what we find. And what she laid out is actually you know, a, a, a common knowledge, right? Even the state and local jurisdiction know helmets save life, and uh, helmet law can potentially increase uh, helmet use. However, what we find is that because there isn't a lot of national leadership in this from the from NHTSA, particularly behavioral, the behavioral countermeasure part of NHTSA, a lot of them are very reluctant to take up this effort to requiring uh, a helmet use. So what we eventually find is that you know a lot of this is also based on an earlier research that NISA have done. They found that the best way to get local and state jurisdiction to pass a bicycle helmet regulation, either for all ages or children, is to have that coalitions of stakeholder, you know, put together the strategy, creating the supports before that they, you know, uh, 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 introduce a bill for a particular regulation. And, uh, and that is the intent of our recommendation, is to create a resources, create a NHTSA um, uh, leadership, and create a template, if you may, the model law. Therefore, the state and local jurisdiction have more of an opportunity and more of the resources to introduce a bill that have a, uh, a higher chance to, to, to pass. Did Can I you, respond? Did, well, let's see. Um, I'm yes, conflicted. Well, okay, okay. Well, I've learned not to argue with her. Uh, finding number 23, let me just repeat it one more time, which we just adopted. The NTSB concludes that a comprehensive strategy that includes both helmet legislation and complementary non-legislative interventions is most likely to increase overall helmet use among bicyclists of all ages. Helmet legislation, so we just approved a finding talking about the need for helmet laws and we talk in depth about how helmet laws could increase, will it have been proven to increase helmet usage? And so we're not talking about a recommendation to NHTSA here to require the state. So if the NHTSA doesn't want to take it up, they don't have to. But, and the um, remaining uh, recommendations that you stated about a coalition, that remains in place. That can still be done. The second recommendation, which is the model legislation and putting something in countermeasures at work, fantastic, do it. I think it's great, that can still be done. But we need something else that actually says, what if model legislation never gets done? What if the coalition never agrees? We still need, or maybe they do, and but we still have a recommendation out there that says that states should adopt uh, an all age helmet law. Vice Chairman, did you want to say anything? Thanks, pal. I'm, I hear both sides, and this is the on the one hand and on the other. And um, as I said, I'm, I'm really struggling with this because um, I, I agree with Member Hamandy uh, about uh, her points. She makes them very, very clearly. And we know that when the law sets out the guidance, that the people generally start to follow the law. And it started off, and she made a very good point about uh, uh, seat belts and shoulder harnesses, which uh, we, of course, endorsed. Um, I also hear the chairman with with his point about you know where do we where do we come out in in this process. Um, the The challenge is, I guess, as to whether we we know what is likely to happen, and I'll saw myself off a tree limb here, but 
what's likely to happen is when we make this recommendation that there are there's going to be pushback from a number of groups who are equally passionate about you know I'll be responsible for what I do and and you guys shouldn't be telling me uh, about this and um, we typically uh, tend not to be too concerned about that, but by the same token, we also want to look at how's the best way to get this accomplished in the shortest possible time. Uh, Member Hamandi raises a very good point of, you know, recommendation four, let's get everybody together. And then uh, I see we insert it as a change that after that's done, then we put together a model law. Uh, she also has a very good point uh, that sometimes these things never happen. So, um, I'm inclined to say that we go ahead and suffer the slings and arrows of the, 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 the uh, users out there and say, let's, let's do this. Let's do it with the understanding. And I don't know if there's a way to word this that says, you know, we understand that people have a different view on this, but, uh, you know, we need to move forward. And I'm, I'm now back into listening mode. So, um, so I intend to support it. Um, because you make a very compelling point. Um, our job is not a popularity contest. We're not here to take a, a straw poll to see who wants it or who doesn't. Uh, our job is to, as you said, is to is to is to say is to speak the truth, which we already have done on our finding that we approve. We we already adopted a finding that said this is the best countermeasure for reducing. Uh, uh, head injuries. We've already adopted that, but I think that uh, we need to take a stand, and uh, and and I intend to support it. I do have a couple of questions. Uh, we say require that all persons wear age-appropriate bicycle helmet. Does this mean that I that I can't wear one that uh, looks like uh, Barney the dinosaur? What does age-appropriate mean? Age appropriate means you wouldn't have an adult wearing a child helmet and a child wearing an adult helmet because the helmet wouldn't fit correctly and, and it, it wouldn't, wouldn't protect work. you. Finally, there will be, hopefully there will be some state legislature somewhere. And I realize that uh, we, we came out with 0.05 recommend, well, we came out with the cell phone recommendation in December of 2011. Uh, that's been uh, eight years later. No, no state has done exactly what we've wanted. Uh, we've got one state that's, that's gone with 0.05 and some others that are considering it. Distractions, we've had no states to uh, fully embrace what we've, what we've called for. But, but eventually, I mean, again, our job, as you did say, is to, is, to, is to say what's the best thing. Let the legislatures hash it out. There will be some legislature that says, well, when riding a bicycle. So would you consider a friendly am amendment or do you think it's worthwhile to be, say, when riding a pedaled cycle or something like that? Because under, under, I realize for the purposes of this study, we've called a bicycle to be bicycles, unicycles, tricycles, but But somebody will read this at some point, and we want them to adopt it. So what, is your, what are your thoughts there? My thought is, since we referenced bicycles throughout the study, that we keep it at bicycles. But, you know, I would, I would state that, uh, to your point on different states, might address this differently or want to address this differently. We have a process, fortunately, where when states respond to us on recommendations and they've addressed it in a certain way, we evaluate that response and determine whether it, it meets our safety objectives about the rec regarding the recommendation and often close recommendations either reconsidered or alternate accepted, so. Any further discussion? Okay, it's been moved and seconded to adopt the amendment offered by Member Hamandi to require that this would be to all 50 states, the District of Columbia and Puerto Rico,
to require that all persons shall wear an age-appropriate bicycle helmet when riding a bicycle. That's been moved and seconded. All in favor, please signal with a hand and say aye. Aye. Opposed, there are none. That amendment passes unanimously. Thank you very much. Thank you for your leadership. Okay, so we adopted that. Now, do we have a motion to adopt the recommendations as we just amended? So moved. Vice Chairman Second. moves. Member Hamadi seconds. Any discussion? All in favor of adopting the recommendations as amended, please signal with a hand and say aye. Opposed, there are none. The recommendations have been adopted unanimously as we just amended them. Uh, are there any other uh, issues for discussion as it relates to this report? Okay, I'd like to entertain a motion to adopt the report as revised. I so move. It's been member Hamadi. It's been seconded by the vice chairman. Any further discussion on that? It's been moved and seconded to adopt the, the report as amended. All in favor, please signal with a hand and say aye. Opposed, there are none. The report has been adopted unanimously. Do any members wish to file a concurring or dissenting statement? Uh, I'd, I'd like to concur. Yeah. Member Hamadi wishes to file a, or a, a statement offers you wish to reserve the right to offer uh, to offer a statement in closing I do want to thank my colleagues for the great preparation that has gone into preparing for this board meeting uh, I also want to thank you for the great discussions and debate and that's what this is all about these are the actual discussions of the board the actual deliberations of the agency uh, a special thanks goes to the Office of Research and Engineering and the Office of Highway Safety for, to the staff. Uh, Ivan Chung, thank you very much, but you've had a great team to work with. You are the project manager, but again, you had a great team. I always say, though, that nothing around here happens with just one or two people. It is indeed a team effort. And uh, uh, we've got a lot of great support and program staff that, uh, that make things happen. A good example would be at 7.30 this morning when the audio system doesn't work in this boardroom. For whatever reason, all hands get called on deck to do whatever it takes to make it work. And so um, I always like to recognize the program and the support staff who, um, who work behind the scenes. The recommendations that we issued and reiterated today, if acted upon, will save lives as vulnerable road users begin to be accounted for in crash warning and prevention systems, as well as connected vehicle systems. These recommendations will result in better active lighting for vehicles, better road design to separate motor vehicles from bicycles and other vulnerable road users, and long overdue reevaluation of bicycle conspicuity standards, among other measures. Since bicycles are subject to the same road environment and the other safety features and the safety features, excuse me, as since bicycles are subject to the to the to the road environment and the safety features of motor vehicles, bicycle safety can never only be the concern to individual bicyclists. Action is necessary on the part of the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration and the Federal Highway Administration for this nation to reach its full potential for bicycle safety. The individual bicyclist can take steps to avoid a crash by obeying the traffic rules and controls, such as signals, and increasing conspicuity. For example, through the use of bicycle lights. And in the event of a crash, as we know, bicyclists are safer wearing a bicycle helmet that meets federal bicycle helmet standards. But this board is also aware of the need for action on many recommendations reiterated to NHTSA in this report and newly issued recommendations to NHTSA and the FHWA. Through slow action on advanced vehicle lighting systems, bicyclists and other vulnerable road users are hidden from view of drivers. Slow action keeps vulnerable road users in the blind spots of trucks. It keeps them unrecognized by connected vehicle systems. It allows them to be treated as an afterthought 
in collision avoidance systems. 857 bicyclists died in crashes with motor vehicles last year. That's more than that's not, that's more than the number of people died in this country in airplane crashes. Vulnerable road users not only deserve the latest safety standards that the modal administrations can help provide, they need them, and we need them sooner rather than later. We stand adjourned.